Today's 48 Team World Cup Extravaganza Total Soccer Show is sponsored by Roughneck Scarves. Roughneck Scarves, the official provider of scarves to US Soccer, NCAA, Major League Soccer, and USL. They're also the provider of, it seems like, every national team ever scarf. I yeah. uh, check their website, and they have well over 70, I stopped counting at 70, national teams represented that you can buy scarves for. So it's possible that the 2026 teams mm-hmm. that go to the World Cup, the 48 teams, Roughneck Scarves already has a scarf for every team that will be there. Yep. And it's, it's possible. Not, and it's amazing because they're not just, like... Vietnam is great. They've got like (laughs) country specific designs. They've also got something, I think the Polish one is written in Polish. So impressive work from Polska, I believe. That sounds about right. Yeah, sure. (laughs) (laughs) They also have the Total Soccer Show scarf. This is very true. And we're again so proud that the Total Soccer Show scarf is made by and sold by roughneckscarves.com. That we are. That we are. I also want to say the people at Roughneck Scarves are great to work with. We've Mm -hmm. really enjoyed all our interactions with them. We're really happy with the customer service um, our listeners have received there. Listeners can also receive 20% Mm -hmm. off any scarf in the Roughneck Scarf store. How do they do that, Taylor? Well, first they go to roughneckscarves.com. That's spelled R-U-F-F would be the rough in that one. (laughs) Make your selection, obviously. That's kind of important when making a purchase. Uh, When you check out, use the promo code TOTALSOCCERSHOW, all one word, all uppercase, to get, as you said, 20% off. Thank you to Roughneck Scarves for sponsoring today's episode. You're going to hear some drum clicks, you're going to hear some music, and then you're going to hear a very long and very detailed discussion about the 48-team World Cup. Hello and welcome to a 48 Team World Cup special (laughs) edition of the Total Soccer Show. I am Daryl Grove and I'm joined by a man from one of the 211 FIFA Nations. It's Taylor Rockwell. Hello, that is accurate. And then we've got, what, 46 other people coming in today just to round it out, (laughs) just so we can all feel... Like, get a feel for what's about to come, right? We can all fit around this table. Yeah, share, sure. Share some microphones. Sure. <laughs> as long as the 46 other uh, people who are going to be contributing are very, very skinny. <laughs> so, yeah, they'd fit in. They'd yeah. fit in well. Yeah. Um, so, this morning at 4.35 a.m. U.S. Eastern Time, <laughs> it was a bit later in Zurich, uh-huh. FIFA, the FIFA Council voted, yep. the 37 members of the FIFA Council, Council voted mm-hmm. to approve a 48-team World Cup starting in 2026 with 16 groups stages of three teams each Mm -hmm. 16 groups of three teams each in the group stage now first of all why do you know the exact time that it happened in the morning because i was doing goal mouth Mm -hmm. um, our morning soccer podcast uh, this morning and i was determined to not do it the night before and not have the news break i got up early um, ready to get it as it happened. Mm-hmm. I you, wasn't up at 4.35 a.m., I'll yeah. say that. You know who probably wasn't thrilled with that decision? Who's that? George Qureshi. Because <laughs> I bet he would have loved to get to use that one on Wednesday, or Tuesday's goal mouth, or Wednesday's, Wednesday's. Yep, it'll yeah. be Wednesday. Today is Tuesday. Days are confusing. We'll see what George does. If, mm-hmm. um, if you don't listen to goal mouth, mm-hmm. uh, this morning would be a good time to give it a go, because I was filled with excitement at the breaking news. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> All right, so yeah, let's get back to this, right? Because yeah. I think it's happened. It's definitely happened. Yeah. It's definitely happening. The mm-hmm. details, some of the details are going to be firmed up in Mm -hmm. May we've been told right all we know is it's 48 teams from 2026 onwards and that it will be um, 16 groups of three is the original setup and then a knockout round of Mm -hmm. 32 teams on yeah it has happened. There is no point complaining about it. I'm, I think I'm a little more up on it than most of the people on Twitter. Like yeah. I'm a little more thumbs up on it. Okay. But what we've decided to do on today's show mm. is we've thought up like every angle you can come at this from mm. and all the questions it raises. And we're pretty much going to try and check them all off and go through as many things as we can think of um, to answer as many questions as people might have. Right. Is that fair? Yeah. With a healthy balance of positive and negative. Yeah, who's sure. That, we'll who's try. that blind lady with the scales? We're going to try and be like her. Lady Justice. That's her. Mm-hmm. We're going to try and be like her. All right. We'll try. We'll try-ish, <laughs> sort of, kind of, maybe. Where do you want to start, Tyler? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, uh, to let you pick the area to start with. I actually want to start with financials for a specific reason. Financials, mm-hmm. all right. So it's esti- the estimates Typical. are that it's going to... Well, for a reason. The estimates are that it's going to increase revenue for FIFA by about a billion dollars. Yeah. That's the expectation. I saw 521 million pounds. Well, there you go. Yeah. I guess, you know, conversions and whatnot. It's not quite the right exchange rate, I which I think, think so. means people don't know exactly how much. These are guesses at yeah. how much extra revenue. Yeah, I think so. 
But I think more, um, more is the answer, there, right? Uh, Gabriel Marcotti for ESPN wrote mm-hmm. a good article, uh, basically in favor of this, more or less in favor. I think he was nece- he wasn't necessarily saying it's going to be great, but I think he was pointing out the reasons why it's good and why some of the arguments against are maybe unfair. Okay, and one of his points was that. Yes, a lot has been made of this extra money, but the reality is that Gianni Infantino promised two things when he was elected. He promised basically that there's going to be an expanded World Cup. That was one of his campaign promises, and that there's going to be more money for member states to develop soccer at a local level. Yeah. If you want to promise more money, how do you do that? You have to make more money from the World Cup. It makes, I think, the number was 85% of FIFA's revenues come from the Men's World Cup. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And selling the rights and selling sponsorships and all that good stuff. Yeah. So... Work hard at FIFA Club World Cup. True. <laughs> so if you want to make money, you've got to expand that format. Yep. So it's basically him being a politician. And mm-hmm. that's the reality. That's politics. And isn't it also him fulfilling his promises? Because he yeah. really did run on this platform of, I'm going to expand the World Cup. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. And he talked about bringing more money. Mm-hmm. So it's not as if this has been kind of cloak and dagger and secret. We all kind of knew this was coming. No. Yeah. I think I think th- so. I think all of that is fair. I think the reason we're the... The point where I start to get a little frustrated is that I think with that it felt like there was more of a significant plan in place that Infantino had maybe met with some people, had an idea of exactly what he wanted to do, and maybe this was it. But then it became, well, maybe we'll expand to 40, maybe it'll be 48, maybe it'll be five teams of 10 or four teams of 10 or whatever. Yeah. Uh, Or four groups, rather, obviously. Um, And so I think with that you have this idea that he's got a very specific plan for what he wants to do. And so then he's going to deliver upon that plan. And so when it's, I know what I want to do, but I don't really know how it's going to happen, that's where I feel like some of the reaction has come about because all of a sudden it's three teams and 16 groups. It's not quite what people expected. But it is what's happening. Mm -hmm. So let's stay on topic and Mm -hmm. think about the financials, right? Because that's the thing you wanted to talk about first. Mm -hmm. It will bring in more money. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. It just means because this will be a bigger tournament, Mm -hmm. um, there's more opportunities for sponsorship. And I think what you were alluding to at the beginning is that means FIFA brings more money it can then give more money to the fifa Itself. member no to the <laughs> fifa member nations right or the bonus money, checks whatever i mean there there is there are obviously uh, there's lots of suspicion of corruption mm-hmm. but money does go from fifa to member federations right, right? Mm-hmm. and then what happens at the member federation level is not mm-hmm. always easy to oversee mm-hmm. but i can understand if you are and i'm genuinely picking a country at random like uh, not trying to Like, say, Wales, right? Mm -hmm. Say, Wales wants more money for its FA. It's going to have more money now with a bigger World Cup. Yeah, and then it's everybody. So it's also, like, the Canary Islands, I think, was the one that The Guardian explained her on this this development. And it means more to them, right? Mm -hmm. Right, Yeah. yeah, because then the idea being that the smaller countries then get money. It allows them to develop and try to then be comp- more competitive further down the road. Yeah. So how, how cynical are you about FIFA making money? Because I've the reaction I saw to a lot of this is, isn't FIFA supposed to be a non-profit? Well, yeah, and the response to that is that it's a non-profit in the sense that the money has to be reinvested in the yeah. organization. If the board, if the, if the president is a member of FIFA, if he's working for FIFA, then it can be re- reinvested in his bonus check, for example. Right. But it can also be invested in the individual member states. And I think the reality is it's a nonprofit. Probably a little bit of both. Yeah, it will be. And the reality <laughs> is it's a nonprofit with not much oversight. And I mm-hmm. think that's where people get frustrated is that you can, say, with Trinidad and Jack Warner when he was in charge, they might get $5 million for development, but that doesn't necessarily mean— For building mean, new fields. Yeah, yeah, or for building a whole new complex, which ends up being they like clear one field and yeah, they yeah. put two goals up. And so yes, that was and five they million. spend 100000 and exactly. pocket the difference, right? Exactly, yeah. right. So <laughs> all, all of a sudden, those two goalposts were very expensive at $2 million each. Yeah. They're made of space-age technology. So, I mean, I think there's, there's, there's frustration there. And then the reality, and that's the reason why I was explaining, or going back to like the Gab Marcotti uh, politics side of it, is just that you could easily switch that into to Infantino said, vote for me, I'll give you $5 million. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of what happened, but it's also kind of disingenuous to say that that's actually what happened. But if you're the Canary Islands, why wouldn't you be in favor of that? Yeah, absolutely. It goes a long way. Absolutely, absolutely. So, (laughs) I mean, I think, so yes, there's going to be more money coming in and it is going to be, it's going to get spread out. But I think that is an, an inevitability of FIFA. And I know some people would say, you know, we'll tear down FIFA, change FIFA, change the way it's operating, put it we under did, the... right? That happened. Yeah, you know, put it under the UN, something like that. But the reality is that's not going to happen, at least not right now. So so let's talk about the actual mm-hmm. expansion of teams then, because sure. the other part of the politicking of this is the other reason that teams um, would vote for this mm-hmm. is so that they have a better chance of right. getting to the World Cup mm-hmm. and, and experiencing that glory, right? Yeah. Sitting here in the United States, coming from England, coming from other teams that kind of mostly regularly, um, mm-hmm. 1994 notwithstanding, yep. um, make it to the World Cup. 
that seems like less of a big deal. But I think if you're from a nation that doesn't regularly make the World Cup and an expansion of 32 to 48 mm-hmm. gives you a much better chance, this would seem like a good thing. Yeah, and, and I will speak for myself here. And, yeah. I, and I know this is going to make me sound bad, I'll be honest. But like, I think it's really easy when you are, for example, a fan of the U.S. national team. That's who I support. That's the number one team I root for when it comes to the World Cup. They do make it all the time. It's something that you kind of take for granted. Mm-hmm. Since and 1990. I think, and I think you also have the stories of Sepp Blatter and uh, uh, who am I forgetting here? Used to be the head of UEFA. Michel uh, Platini. Platini. Whew, that was a, I've, fr- I've had him removed from my brain since they were removed from FIFA. Um, I think you can look at them and you have this idea of like, oh, it's just like smaller countries just want money. It's just corruption. It's just FIFA being bad. But if you remove yourself from that perspective, as you're saying, as you're trying to do, yeah. you realize, like, yeah, some countries always get to go and other countries never get to go. Mm-hmm. And if you're moving towards incorporating more countries, some would say that means you're diluting the talent pool. But the reality is it's supposed to be this spectacle showcase event for yeah. all of world soccer. Yes. And I think that's it becomes more that when you have more teams. I absolutely agree mm-hmm. with that. I think if, um, let's say... Egypt yep. have a better chance of making it, mm-hmm. then it's more inclusive and Egypt get included in the World Cup. Right? Yeah. And if you start thinking about sort of, yeah, the, the World Cup as a global spectacle, why not get more of the globe involved? Mm-hmm. And this is where you run into problems, though, because it, it, it becomes this... I almost wanted to play a game with you where I was just going to make you say, that's good, that's bad, back and forth, because you really could do that because... I'll you, do it. I'm game for anything. You get more teams, and that means more teams are there. That's good. But there's no guarantee that those teams are any good. Well, that's bad. But that means that you get a lot more like disparity of talent, which means you could have more interesting games. Well, that's good. But it could also mean that people park the bus, and then you have defensive games that are boring. Well, uh-huh. that's bad. And like you can just keep going down yeah, that rabbit hole. And I think that that's part of the problem with this structural change and the and the kind of the rapidity that, with which it's come yeah. upon us that it doesn't leave much time for processing. I want to say two things mm-hmm. in favor of having more teams okay. at the World Cup, just in terms of more teams making it. Mm-hmm. The first is a great graph I saw that the number of teams at the World Cup mm-hmm. has increased in re- like uh, in correlation to mm-hmm. how many FIFA member nations there are. Mm-hmm. Right. So if you go back to what is it, uh, 1930, the first World Cup. There were 13 teams, mm-hmm. right? After that, there were 16 teams for right. a long time. Then there were 24 teams in 1982. Right. Then there were 32 teams in 1998. Mm-hmm. As we get more and more nations, it sort of actually makes sense to keep adding teams because there are more teams in the world, mm-hmm. right? Right. So this is just a natural outgrowth. This is what's always happened. And just because there's only been 32 teams in your lifetime, and if you're a recent soccer fan, mm-hmm. it makes sense that you think the World Cup is a 32-team event. Um, it's not true that that is the only way the World Cup can be. It's true. It is worth noting that part of the reason why it was shifted in the 80s is because the three-team group format wasn't working very well. Right. (laughs) So there is that to consider. Um, I would also add that part of the expansion was because it used to be that first World Cup, yeah, there's fewer teams because you're getting there by boat. True. <laughs> like, which makes it a little bit harder. So with the rise of rapid technology, of rapid transportation, it makes it easier for teams to commute. So mm-hmm. it makes a little more sense. Once we get the Hyperloop, we can do all, all teams. Yeah, but like the biggest, the biggest one worth noting that I, I've seen reported a couple times is uh, in 1966, there were zero African teams because they boycotted. And they boycotted because the only way an African team could get there was in a playoff against all the Asian teams. That's right. how it worked. So, <laughs> And that one Asian team who ended up getting to go as a result was North Korea, who had a pretty interesting tournament yeah they did but still Goodison Park remembers so I mean and and this is how Joe Havelange became FIFA president in the first place in the 70s is by promising to bring in more teams Mm -hmm. when I think it was especially necessary so Um, do do you agree with me then because what I've been getting at is the the World Cup has always been expanding it's never got smaller so this is not like some weird crazy mm -hmm. wacky thing that's happening so this is the natural outgrowth of the World Cup I, I agree with you but I think my point more so is that in those times, like when it has changed in the past, I feel like it was for specific reasons that things weren't work- working. There was maybe some collusion in the 80s. Maybe it, it was too confusing where it was like the third best second place team, but then the second best third place team somehow. Like it became too confusing. The shift to 32 teams, it makes it very straightforward. And I think in this yeah. situation, yes, incorporating more teams theoretically is a good thing, but by the same token, if it's not like with any specific purpose in mind and it's not like all of these teams these great teams are are not being included we need to find a way to rectify that it seems more so like i want to appeal to a broad base so i can win this election and then maybe also some teams then do get to be included then i think it's somewhere in between so let's hit on that idea of the dilution of 
quality, mm-hmm. I want to say. And there are two ways of looking at this. There's the quality of the games that you watch mm-hmm. and the quality of the teams that are there. Mm-hmm. And I think I read a Gab Marcotti quote that said essentially those two things aren't related. Like, mm-hmm. Better teams don't necessarily make for better games. Mm-hmm. You can have like two really tactically astute teams and that's mm-hmm. their thing. That's what makes them good and that makes for terrible television. Who's, uh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, man, I'm just drawing blanks left and right. Famous Milan coach, Arrigo Saki, there it is, came up with it. His, wasn't he the one who had the, the, fra- like the, the famous saying of the, like, the perfect soccer game ends nil-nil? Like, because its teams have executed their game plans perfectly right. and responded yeah, and adjusted yeah. accordingly. Yeah, it does not necessarily guarantee that it's going to be the most exciting game. Yeah. So, yeah, with that, if you get different teams bringing in different tactics or playing different styles or just being a complete unknown, which mm-hmm. can happen when you all so- suddenly expand and you have, what, nine and a half teams coming in from, uh, from Asia, you maybe don't know <laughs> as much about them. You don't know as much about the Uzbek play- team because a lot of them play in the Uzbek League. That's the other thing for me mm-hmm. is I think with the expansion going to um, – nations that you're less familiar mm-hmm. with it does mean that you're going to see teams that you haven't really paid much attention mm-hmm. to before to me just as a, i want to call myself an inquisitive soccer watcher mm-hmm. like i get excited when i see new teams and new players right yeah. and i'll enjoy the opportunity to do that in a, like a mm-hmm. worldwide national spectacle i also want to say full international dis- spectacle i want to step away from this conversation for just one second because i still think i am a little bit more negative than you are yeah but full disclosure we talked about this for about an hour and a half before we recorded this yeah, show to figure out what we're going to hit and on. we stumbled upon something that makes me more in favor of it than I was in the past. So I just want to say that to explain why I'm more positive about it now because I think a lot of these objections are valid and there's far more negative reasons than I think we've hit upon yet. But part of the reason why I think I'm taking a more positive approach than I would have at the beginning of this podcast is because I think there's going to be some changes brought in by FIFA that it's going to make it more... It's going to make what they're trying to do with the number of teams going make more sense. I think it's just because I'm very persuasive. That could also be. Who knows for sure. <laughs> anyway, to get back to the dilution of talent. Yeah, so, so you go from 32 teams mm-hmm. to 48 teams. The big argument I've seen is that there are going to be lots of very, very bad teams there or mm-hmm. teams that like aren't worthy to be there. So what we did is we went and looked at the 2014 World Cup yep. and then looked at some of the teams that didn't make it. Mm-hmm. And I think you can put a, put together a pretty good argument for it's not that bad. Okay, and then right? I'm going to shoot holes in that as soon as you're done listing them. Okay, Go ahead. But okay so for example, we all talked at the time, the 2014 mm-hmm. World Cup, Bob Bradley's Egypt deserved to be there, mm-hmm. but because there weren't enough spots um, from Africa, they lost in that playoff to Ghana. Yeah. And Egypt have had this complaint going way, way back. Because I, I used to watch, uh, with more regularity, when I was doing the World Cup blog work, mm-hmm. the African Cup of Nations. Right. Um, Egypt won it, like I think, three times in a row. Like were just dominant in the Africa Cup of Nations, but during that time, never made one World mm-hmm. Cup. So Africa never got to send its best team to the World Cup yeah. in that period. I mean, I think uh, Zambia also won. Relatively recently, they haven't been to a World Cup that I can remember. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, the most recent one, Africa didn't send Senegal or Mali either. Mm-hmm. Like those teams would be an absolute asset to a World Cup. Yeah. Gabon, I can't remember Gabon at a World Cup. That's Pierre Emerick Aubameyang. Yep. I would love to see him at a World Cup. Mm-hmm. And that's just Africa. Look at Europe. You, I mean, you can name multiple teams from Europe that didn't go to the 2014 World Cup. Absolutely. I mean, Sweden, Wales, yeah. Iceland. We went Ireland. through the list, and that was the one that most readily jumps out because yeah. you have so many teams. And it's I think a large part of that is because we have Euro 2016 yeah. as kind of a sounding board. And a lot of so people. You've just point, seen those teams at a tournament, right? And a lot of people point to that as. Uh, and this is where kind of opinion comes in. A lot of people point to that as an example of, well, that was a really boring tournament because everybody was defensive and it wasn't that much fun. If that's your perspective, then that's your perspective when it comes to adding more teams. Mm -hmm. I'll speak for myself and say that I ended up really enjoying Euro 2016 because there were so many teams we didn't know, so many like crazy stories and narratives. Do you remember sitting here figuring out Romania's defensive strategy. Yep. It was that weird like North Star thing where yeah. they all moved in unison like a line dance. Yeah. I mean, that was fascinating to and, watch Romania. Com- I'd never seen much of them before. And completely writing off Hungary because we had no idea who they yeah. were. And then they win the group. So, I mean, <laughs> it, that, that to me makes it more uh, interesting when you have that expansion. And so I think that's why when it comes to UEFA, we have so many more teams listed. It's yeah. so, so much easier to do that because we have those Euros as that sounding board for like, oh, yeah, all of these great teams suddenly aren't yep. going to be included, but now they might be. And the, but there might be teams from, say, the Asian Federation that mm-hmm. didn't make it, say, last time that we don't know about that might be better, right? Okay. There might be by 2026, China, with all the money they're investing and not just in Ork's mm-hmm. salary yep. and, and Carlos Tevez's salary. Uh, we, you know, we had, um, oh, no, I've forgotten her name, but she was an excellent guest on mm-hmm. the show. She lived in China, University of Michigan, yep. um, that she'd... Uh, Hey, Daryl here, cutting in with a quick clarification. The guest was Elaine Vandenberg, and the episode was February 12th, 2016. And Lane gave us great insights into what's happening in China, beyond just the sort of big money transfers and into how China is investing in its soccer future.
Again, that show is from February 12, 2016. She told us that the, the Chinese were investing all this money right. in sort of academies. By 2026, you might have a much better Chinese national yeah. team. And you've listed one team. And that's, that's where I think the holes arise. It's because I absolutely agree with you about Africa. I think Africa deserves more teams because yeah. you either have their old format or you have the current format where you just have four teams in a group, the best one goes. But then you have situations where like, I think the current one – you have Nigeria in with two or three other very good teams. It's going to be difficult, and uh-huh. you're going to be missing some good teams in there. So I think I agree with you on Africa. The problem with UEFA is that you're only sending three more teams than you're already sending. So it's not like they're suddenly getting eight more spots. Yeah, that's true. And well, instead, to be fair, these things are not confirmed. These are right. suggestions, these right? Are, we'll, know, are... we'll know in May what the new breakdown is. So mm-hmm. it could end up with UEFA getting more spots than we know. Yeah, but I used to – but, like, I think if you go back and listen to when the – there were rumors that Infantina was pushing towards more teams. I think you'll hear me say, like, there's no way they do three – there's 16 groups of three teams. That's just not going to happen. <laughs> so at this point, I'm just like, fine, I believe everything. And that leaves us with what we're looking up at the screen. That leaves us with Oceania getting one automatic bid, Asia getting eight and a half. And I think that's where I start to wonder, does Asia really have eight and a half – Teams that are of World Cup qual- I wanna, caliber, I don't necessarily know. I want to hold up my hands and say I don't know either, but mm-hmm. I'd like to find out. Okay. I don't want to be the guy who sits here miles from Asia assuming those teams aren't good enough just because I haven't watched them. Fair enough. Right? That's fair. I would say that to listeners as well, that if you're thinking, oh, those Asian teams are rubbish, like how do you know? How do you know? I think the answer is because they've never won a World Cup. That's the, that's the well, it's kind of hard when you don't get enough spots. There you go. And so, <laughs> again, this is where it's good and bad, back and forth, all oh, yeah. the way down that oh, rabbit yeah. hole. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so then, and maybe we can hold off or maybe we can go to it now. The other expansion would be South America getting six from what they yes. have now, which is four and a half automatic. CONCACAF getting six and a half from three and a half. So the, and then the other big story here is mm-hmm. not too long before this announcement, mm-hmm. uh, there was a story came out, I think through the Venezuelan FA president, said mm-hmm. Gianni Infantino had said to him, if we go to this 48-team World Cup mm-hmm. and everybody gets more spots, I think we should look into a CONMEBOL CONCACAF merger. Right. That means for people who don't like the acronyms, uh, South American qualifying mm-hmm. um, along with the uh, North North American, Central American, Caribbean qualifying, mm-hmm. where the U.S. is, gets merged into one big qualifying group with, what, like 12 or 13 spots mm-hmm. up for grabs. This gets me excited. It, it gets me excited, too. And this is what I was alluding to previously, is that before, like, you can't have a hex with six and a half teams getting to go. Like, I mean, that, that does not work. I'd take it right now. <laughs> I mean, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and you can't have South America get six automatic spots when there are ten teams in South America. I mean, you can, and I can make see for a why. Great tournament. Yeah. But it would not make for a great tournament, and it would certainly not make for good qualification. And we that's, had, sorry, that's what I meant, a good qualification. And we had this con- conversation again previously when we were discussing how there were plans to make CONCACAF World Cup qualifying stretch out longer so you have more teams included longer and not eliminated three years before the tournament even begins. Yeah. I think that's what this does because we couldn't figure out a way to make the group stage more interesting. I think we uh-huh. ended on cutting out one of the stages so you only have three. Uh-huh. But this makes a lot more sense that all of a sudden, if you combine those two, you've got a lot more very good teams coming in, even if it is seven or eight from Common Bowl who are going to be highly competitive. Suddenly you've got those teams. You've got USA, Mexico. You've got Costa Rica, obviously. Then you've got the kind of second tier of CONCACAF. You've got the second tier of Common Bowl, and it becomes a much more compelling qualification campaign. Here's why I like it. This is very selfish. I like it from a U.S. national team Mm -hmm. uh, perspective because even if you merge the two – and you say you've got 12 spots, the U.S. is still in a very good Mm -hmm. um, situation because if you assume we're we're one of the top three teams in CONCACAF Mm -hmm. with Costa Rica and Mexico, I know we're not in the standings right now, but we sort of assume that's our standing, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And you assume that we're better than the worst couple of CONMEBOL teams, it's still not guaranteed, but it's still very likely that we make the World Cup. Mm -hmm. But along the way there's a good chance we play competitive World Cup qualifying games against very good opposition. Right. Suddenly, instead of all the games against sort of uh, not-so-good Caribbean teams, we're mm-hmm. playing like we're playing Ecuador or we're playing, uh, we're playing Bolivia, maybe I want to say, but we might be playing Argentina. But it's still Bolivia we're at playing Altidore. Chile. We're right. playing Chile in World Cup qualifying. Altidore. At altitude. So you've got to learn how to navigate <laughs> that. Altidore at altitude. There you go. Yeah, that happens. <laughs> the other thing that I think is, is especially interesting is that you then, and this is all kind of, on the fly based on this realization that we had. I said we've been talking about this for about an hour. This is about 10 minutes before we started recording that we had this realization. And if you go with this, then it means you're playing better teams throughout qualification. You're playing those South American teams more regularly. Yeah. It means there's also... Raises your game. It raises your game. It also means... Literally in Bolivia. 
Yeah, true. It also <laughs> means there's probably more cross competition, which means maybe you do continue to have the combined Copa America, or maybe you have more. That might, we might look back and see that's the first step towards mm-hmm. this merging, the Copa America Centenario of the last year. And so you get that familiarity. But what it also might very well mean is that it's less likely if you have 16 teams going from Europe, and then this would be 16 and a half teams coming from North and South America, that you're going to get one of those teams in your World Cup group. So it means probably that if you're, say, the USA, you're going to get one European team, and then you're going to get one from Africa, Asia, or Oceania. And I think that that's an interesting grouping to have. Okay. And now you're getting like one, like one from the Western Hemisphere, one from Europe, and then one from elsewhere. It makes for this kind of crazy combination that you could be the USA, if you're unseated, getting like Germany and North Korea. It's a weird <laughs> combination, but it would be interesting to watch. Should we talk format then? Because mm-hmm. in some ways, that's the most that's the weirdest, most interesting part. Because mm-hmm. I can imagine a 48 team World Cup. Yeah. I can only Im- I-, I can sort of conceive of a three team group stage times 16 mm-hmm. sort of but I find it really hard to picture it happening right mm-hmm. and there are all kinds of weird problems with it because I've gotten used to group stages being four teams I feel like the Champions League the World Cup the Euros has trained me that way for the last 20 something yeah. years right? right so 16 groups of three you get drawn in with two other teams mm-hmm. and then like we we wrote out a schedule that group only has three games in it. Yep. Three games total. Your team, like say you're supporting the US, mm-hmm. your team plays two group stage games. Three games total for everybody in the group. Mm-hmm. And then the top two go through to the knockout round. Right. And it's short. It's very short. And this is where I think my negativity returns. Okay. Now, and I, I want to go back to that Marcotti piece just to say, I think he hit the nail on the head with the idea of this format can work with very specific constraints put in place. What were his constraints that he wanted? For example, the problem that you're going to run into with a three-team group is if, say, Brazil is your top-seeded team, if they're, if they're A, and the way you do conventional like round-robin three-team tournaments would be like A plays B, then B plays C, and then A plays C. And the problem there is going to be All that right, if you have so Brazil... So it's unbalanced slightly. Yeah, so then yeah. Brazil, the, the, you could say the best team in that group is going to get the first game and the third game the other t- and with the longest rest period. And Marcotti's point, I think... So it's was, an asymmetrical group stage. Yeah, yeah. his point was that what, happen, what should happen is that if you're the top seed, you play the first two games. So you play A versus B, then you play A versus C, because if you're the top seed, the idea would be that you have the advantage, you should be able to get out of that. And so the idea then is that it kind of creates that B versus C game as being very dramatic as that third group stage game. Okay, that's interesting. But there's no guarantee that happens. And then the other issue that we've come across, going back to, what, 82 World Cup with uh, Austria and Germany, is that then oh. with three teams in a group, you have opportunities for collusion or outright match fixing. So we, I want to credit um, a Reddit user, mm-hmm. Gnorm, maybe Norm. It's yep. spelled G-N-O-R-M. I would have said Norm with a G, but then you would have made fun of me by being like, Norm G? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah. But yes, he did a great breakdown of basically... He or she, Gnorm. Good point. Uh, Gnorm did a very good breakdown of how there's been collusion in the past. What, a biscotto is what it's called? Yeah. When, um, where's, where's the definition there? Yeah. It is the potential for so-called biscotto. Biscotto is a match in which the two participating teams can collude on a certain result, which will benefit both of them. The idea being that that other team in the group has already played both of their games. Yep. So if the two teams come together, make that final game work in their favor, then both of those teams get to go through. Yes. So with a four-team group stage, mm-hmm. it's been since the 80s now, since the last time this had happened and people worried about it, mm-hmm. um, with, you said Austria, West Germany, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's been that the final group stage games, everybody plays at the same time. Right. So if you think of the US in the 2014 World Cup, we were playing against Germany, while Portugal and Ghana happened at the same time. Right. Mm-hmm. So you didn't know going into the game what result you needed because the, it's dynamic, right? The mm-hmm. other result is happening uh, simultaneously. Yeah. So you can't pre-plan. It also well, gives you a neck workout because you're constantly switching yes, back and forth between the, the games. <laughs> because same thing in, in 2002, the United States lost to Portugal, but because Korea beat Portugal... Did I say that right? No, sorry, because the United States lost to Poland, right. Korea beat Portugal, the United States still got to go through. Right. So you're kind of paying attention to both results to like at the hour, same time. Right? Yeah. Left, right, mm-hmm. left, right. So yeah, but with this three-team group stage, obviously right. there are two teams that play the last game in the group. The other team has already played its two games. Right. And that team that's left out is at the mercy of the other two teams mm-hmm. if a specific result can benefit the two teams that are still playing and uh, eliminate that team that's already played. Mm-hmm. And that br- makes sense? Yeah, and briefly without going into too much of a goal Yeah, we don't want to go into the maths. Points, just, it just, is possible. I just want to explain Basically, the the example in question was Austria, West Germany. Austria were on four points at the time, two points for a win. Essentially, what happened is is that Germany, if Germany won one nil, 
they would both still go through with Austria being on top of the group. That's exactly what happened. Germany scored in the first like 10 or 15 minutes, and then both teams backed off noticeably. And I think once te- both teams are doing that, the idea then becomes that, oh, they're not really going at us. We won't go at them. We'll just pass the ball around. Everybody's content with this result. Yeah. We're good to go. So it's not really about match fixing. They don't collude be- before right. the game and say, hey, we're going to do this. Mm-hmm. But if a situation kind of develops early where mm-hmm. it's all set up, they both then back off and everybody's happy. Yeah. And the, the other team that's not playing will get absolutely uh, screwed. Yeah, and I mean, and you have to be realistic at this point and say that if Austria and Germany, West Germany or whomever, are walking onto the field knowing like, hey, if we lose 1-0, we're still okay. So, okay, let's all just, you know, and then that happens, that first goal happens, and everybody's like, well, okay, now we know where we are. Like, people are going to be aware, players are going to be aware, coaches Mm -hmm. the same, and it does leave that up as an opportunity. So the big argument that Gnome makes Mm -hmm. is that FIFA say... Gnome with a G. Gnome with a G, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Gnome. FIFA say... That by having um, tied games in the group stage and with a penalty shootout, mm-hmm. so there's always a winner decided, which is not official, but it's been suggested, right? It's a thing that may become like an actual thing in May, mm-hmm. um, that it eliminates the possibility for this. Mm-hmm. But if you read Gnome's post on Reddit, mm-hmm. very carefully explains that even with the, pen- the, win, f- the win for a penalty, mm-hmm. it, doesn't, it doesn't solve the problem. Because you not. can still end up with uh, three teams on three points and the two teams being able to manipulate the goal difference. Or even worse, if you're assigning full point values to a penalty shootout. So if after if that first first group stage game, Brazil are playing Costa Rica, it finishes nil nil, but Costa Rica have sat back the entire time and then they win on penalties and get the full three points, you're kind of rewarding sitting back. Not that Costa Rica would do that, Costa Rica listeners. That was the first country that came to mind. Mm-hmm. The point being, though, that if you're have giving... You seen, have you seen Costa Rica play? True. <laughs> My point was more so that if it's that first group stage game, it incentivizes sitting back because then it goes to penalty shootouts. Penalty shootouts can be a toss-up. Yeah. You get those three points. What I think could maybe change that is either not doing penalty shootouts, which is fine with me, or having it be sort of like NHL style, where if it goes to penalties, you don't get the full points, but you okay. do get points. You get like so, one or two points? Maybe? Yeah, or so like the team that wins the penalties gets one, the team that loses gets none. Okay. So then you still sort of, it's not such a big punishment to lose the penalty shootout, and it's not such a big encouragement to win a penalty shootout. Right, okay, that, that makes sense to me. I guess, yeah. I will say, though, this, this um, reintroduction mm-hmm. of the possibility for a result where it can be mutually advantageous mm-hmm. to two teams playing at the expense of a team not playing. The reintroduction of that possibility, which had gone, mm-hmm. right, with the 32-team World Cup, is, for me, the biggest negative. Yep. Like, you can, all the other ones, you, I can push those aside and be like, mm-hmm. I actually like most of this. Like, I like more teams. Or mm-hmm. I've, I think I've made that clear. This is the one thing that I think is genuinely a problem. Yeah, because... At the end of it, I mean, we've had this conversation, I think, again, many shows ago about how you like to think that you're a competitor, you're out there, you kind of, what you need to have happen is sort of in the back of your head, but more in your front competitive brain is like, I want to score, I want to get the goals, we want to win this game. But that's still emotional. It's still an emotional belief that everybody wants to win. And you know there are going to be people out there who are very practical and know, hey, we've done what we need to do, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. And the reality is it's an international game, and you could have two Man City teammates on either national team be like, hey, man, you know the situation, right? Because I know the situation. Let's both stare. It could be a knowing look. It's the, it's the Mac and Charlie unbroken eye contact across the restaurant. Like, hey, what are you doing? You know the situation? Because I do. Do you see a way for FIFA to fix this when they sort of uh, decide on more details when they meet again in May? Is there a way to fix the three-team group stage so that it can't be fixed? Uh, I mean, I think... With two you, different meanings of the word. <laughs> basically, I think... That was well done. I think you can do... You can basically put a lot of different like, kind of guiding principles and constraints on them. So you can have that top seeded team play the first two games so they don't get as much of a rest, so then it comes down to those second second teams. You can have... Penalty shootouts, if you want to do that, you can have sort of tiebreakers that incentivize one way or the other. You can put lots of constraints in place. I don't know if it fixes it completely. And again, this goes back to this is why I think it's a problem is because if you're going to come with this drastic change in the way the format's, format is going to be, the way the World Cup's going to operate, you should have this stuff ironed out. It shouldn't be like... Well, this is part of it, right? Once you change everything, mm-hmm. then, you ha- then you like play the tournament through and you're like, oh... Uh oh, we're gonna to have to fix that in twenty thirty. Yeah, but right? but I think, and this is where uh, I think Infantino's Very few first drafts are perfect. <laughs> well, except that this is a major international <laughs> tournament. This isn't a draft. No, it'd be called World Cup twenty twenty six. This is first draft. This okay. This is the mentality. <laughs> you know what my f- second favorite or maybe favorite movie is of all time? It's Jurassic Park. 
you have the John Hammond mentality that leads to people getting eaten because you're like, it'll work out. We'll figure it out on the fly. Once we're open, we're good to go. And you know how that went. You get eaten by a T-Rex. So I, I think my the thing I wanted to get to is that uh, in I mean, the, that's why you don't host it on Jurassic Park Island. Well, yeah, that's a good, let's, <laughs> let's hope that's ruled out. More on hosting later on. Uh, but first, I did want to say I heard Infantino talk about part of the reason why they're doing this is because FIFA and the World Cup are still in the 20th century and that they want to move to the 21st century. And I feel like he's saying that while thinking that FIFA are operating in like 1950s because the idea – I think this would have been okay in the 50s because you don't have – massive instant coverage and that you have time to be like hey newspapers around the world we've changed the way it's going to be and we'll let you know how it's going to happen in three more months yeah. that doesn't really work nowadays I mean, you kind of got to have it all figured out again four thirty-five a.m this morning mm-hmm. this news was announced what 4 p.m uh yeah. Eastern, 12 hours later, Mm -hmm. we're recording a podcast looking at it from all angles. Yes. That didn't happen in 1934. It sure didn't. It sure didn't. (laughs) Uh, So, I mean, I think – and that does leave me with concerns. Okay. So the other – apart from constraints, Mm -hmm. the other option that I see is the carrot, right? And the carrot is you finish top of the three-team group. Mm -hmm. Then in the round of 32, which is now a knockout round, Mm -hmm. you play a second-place team. So you incentivize finishing first in the group, which I'm pretty confident Mm -hmm. is how – because people have had questions about this. I'm pretty confident this is how it's going to work. You win your group, you're guaranteed to play a second-place team Mm -hmm. in the next round. So it's worth finishing first. Yeah, because I think there was some questions as to is this going to be like the Champions League draw where once you go through, then there's a draw to see who plays whom, and that would be chaos. I right. think it has to be kind well, of Well, no, sad. actually, Champions League round of 16. That is still first versus second. Yeah, yeah. it's still mm-hmm. first versus second, but with some weird, like, um, uh, things where you can't play a team from your own nation, you can't play a team from your group, and all that mm-hmm. sort of stuff. Yeah, but, but what, what I mean to say is that if you know that you're getting, like, if you know that you're getting, if you're in group A and you're getting the winner of group B, and yeah. group B's winner is clearly going to be Brazil, Argentina, Germany, yeah. you don't want to play the winner of that. Oh, I see. Like, yeah. You know, versus like, oh, it could be any of the other ones. Who knows exactly what it's going to be? So I'm fine with getting second place as opposed to first because it might work out in my favor. <laughs> so shall we talk hosting? Sure. Is it a problem to be having 80 games instead of, uh, I think, 64 games? Yeah, 32 team tournaments as it stands is 64 games. Mm-hmm. Uh, FIFA have said, and you know the math works out, we've looked into it, this would be 80 games total. Mm-hmm. So I think because there's only two games in the group stage, if you go all the way through and mm-hmm. win the tournament or play in the third place game, you still only play seven games, right? It's the same number of seven games. Eight, yeah. uh-huh. Seven, it's definitely seven. Okay. Um, but it um, it does mean that there are more games total in the entire tournament for people to, for the country to have to host, essentially. Mm-hmm. Is that a problem? The short answer is no, because they've said they're going to finish it in the same amount of time. So it's not going to extend the World Cup by much more time. But I feel like need, it probably will. Do you need more space, though? Do you need more space in order to play those 80 games? No. I think, and, I think, and by space, I mean literally stadiums. I believe they've said that under this format, you'll still be able to get it done in the current number of stadiums. I don't know if that's 12 or 16, because Russia yeah. is going to be 16. Uh, but I think it doesn't require more like grounds to actually be played on. The problem that I have seen discussed is if you have a smaller country, if you have all these countries there, do you have enough training facilities? Do you have enough world, world-class world facilities where everybody can make their home base? That's a, Yeah, and enough hotels mm-hmm. for all the fans. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> hotels for the fans, but like secure facilities because you know the national teams aren't going to necessarily want to stay at a hotel that's surrounded by fans. Mm-hmm. That's going to be a problem. Yeah, so, and a successful team, like mm-hmm. say Germany, you had that whole training camp mm-hmm. built in Brazil, yep. right? Because they wanted their own thing. Yeah, mm-hmm. there's now, what, 16 more teams yeah. might be wanting something similar. Yeah, so I, th- I think... I really do also think that this points to they're sort of looking at North America either as Mexico, USA, Canada as one bid or the Mm -hmm. USA getting that 2026 World Cup and thinking they could host that right now. That won't be a problem. We'll figure it out after that tournament. (laughs) Sort of as like we know that it doesn't matter. You could say the United States needs 50 giant stadiums they'll be fine. So, <laughs> so I mean, that's not really an issue. And even the infrastructure in terms of um, not great in terms of transport, I want to say, in some cases. Yeah. I mean, air- airplanes, yes. I but, mean, well, uh, rail air- travel, not so much. I'm assuming they'll be flying charter because I can say that my experience recently with United would make me say that, <laughs> no, maybe they won't be fine. Um, definitely, um, like, top-level training facilities, not a problem right. in the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm also thinking uh, England, mm-hmm. a much smaller country, mm-hmm. much denser, could still be done. There's a lot of really high quality um, sporting infrastructure, yeah. mm-hmm. including stadiums and training facilities. But it, I think it does start to rule out. Um, honestly, it would rule out Qatar mm-hmm. because suddenly that you would need to build more infrastructure to host the 48 teams. So in some ways, 
it at least makes World Cup bids would have to be more realistic than the original I mean, Qatar bids. And it might have even ruled out South Africa. Like, I mean, because so yeah. much construction had to be done to make... Because you need new infrastructure. Yeah. yeah. And so I think then, if the whole point of it is to grow the game to allow other countries to participate, ostensibly other countries to host, yeah. you're kind of making it harder for smaller countries to get that opportunity. I'm trying to figure out where the cutoff is. Like, say if England could still do it. I feel and like I'm you've assuming... just set it up for yourself. What's that? The cutoff is Qatar. <laughs> You're welcome. I'll be here all week. I mean, I, to be honest, I'm still, I still have a problem with Qatar hosting the World Cup. When <laughs> yeah. It doesn't, yeah. I mean, that's a whole <laughs> different thing to get into yeah. in terms of how ready that is infrastructure-wise. Yeah. But is the sort of like um, a smaller European country um, or a smaller South American country that could have hosted a 32-team mm-hmm. World Cup can't host a 48-team yeah, World Cup? I think so. I mean, I think that is something that has to be put into consideration, that it requires a far more logistics, far more hotels, far more facility to be set up and everything to be planned. And yeah, I think it makes it harder overall, for sure. All right, how or, about... or more nefariously, it means that FIFA then are the ones who say, don't even worry about it. We know what we're doing. We'll do the organizing. But now that means that we're <laughs> controlling everything. Here's how much it will cost. Exactly. Here's how, how much it will cost. Or we'll, that means we're taking this much more percentage of everything that yeah. comes in. And then it becomes a completely self-serving move by FIFA. All right, then silver lining, though, mm-hmm. for U.S. fans, yep. is at least we might get to host the 2026 World Cup. Or part of it. In some form. Mm-hmm. In some form, yeah. Mm-hmm. Or because, part of it. Because then I think the other argument then becomes, well, you're right, one country can't host it, one small country. But then you put four together or five together or a whole continent. Why not? And it becomes, oh, it's a global tournament, so why not make it a global game? And that's what tends to happen. I could be swayed by that argument, to be honest, of uh, World Cups being spread out a little bit more in terms of hosting, like lots of co-hosting situations. Yeah, I think it just always becomes where do you draw the line? And yeah. and <laughs> it is sort of difficult to argue because it's the United States, which is a massive landmass, yeah. and you forget just how big it is yeah, until you fly like across continent. it. Right, and so with that comes the idea of like, it, when do you stop? Does it become, oh, we've got all of Europe is going to host one World Cup or all of Asia? <laughs> I mean, that would be the same as the US hosting. <laughs> yeah, that's my point, though. Is like I say that that's like a ludicrous idea, but then I don't know if it really is because in reality, I think I'm thinking of US getting support. US is going to get support wherever it plays in the United States, right. whereas it's not if they're playing one game in Denmark and then one game in Greece. Right. I'd like to ask Ludacris's ideas. <laughs> um, so the other thing is 80 games. He's already got a holiday. We can talk about hosting, right? We talk about hosting. What about as viewers? Mm-hmm. If you're at home watching this on TV, can you in a month watch 80 games of soccer instead of 64? Well, we'll find out. Assuming right. that we're still doing this world, this show in 2026. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we'll give it a good go, mm-hmm. right? Just like we did this summer, which I feel like was kind of a, a dry run. Watching yeah. two tournaments as we did is kind Pretty of much. like watching yeah. a massive um, World Cup. Okay, but okay, maybe our experience is somewhat different to mm-hmm. most people's experience, right? Because we like obviously really committed ourselves to watching all the games this summer. We could do the same in 2026. Mm-hmm. If you've got to like maybe go to work during the day, and then suddenly there's all like four or five games to watch when mm-hmm. you get home, it's suddenly not possible. That literally won't be enough hours in the day. There's a chance, like a chance, that you actually can watch more. Um, because we well, did the math, right? And it means that you're going to have the same number of group stage games. Yes, because... it's 48 group stage games mm-hmm. with um, eight groups of four. Yep. And it's 48 group stage games with 16 groups of three. Right. Yes. Which means we double check that. Which means you're probably going to have roughly the same television schedule for those group stage games. The difference would be that with the current one, the 2014 iteration, you have, because you don't want there to be any collusion, those final group stage games are played at the same time, yeah. right? So A versus B, C versus D, playing at the same time, kickoff is the same, so there's no opportunity for collusion. Mm-hmm. If you don't have that anymore, that then means that you don't have to have everybody playing one on ESPN, one on ESPN2, or one on, on FS1, one on FS2. Yeah. So then you can kind of spread those games out a little bit more, stagger them, so oh, you don't so have to choose saying. one or the other. So you don't have to watch, try and watch two at once. Right. right. And, but then in terms of the number of hours of soccer you'd mm-hmm. need to try and watch to take in the whole tournament, do we get to like a, an absolute saturation point? Probably. But what I mean, though, is that say... 16 you, knockout s- round games. Say in, a, in that final day, though, of yeah. the group stage, say you decided to take off work because you want to watch a game. Well, what that would have meant previously is that maybe you're only getting to watch two games because you've got four teams playing, yeah. or eight teams playing, or however many, but you can't watch two games, so you have to choose one. Whereas with this one, if they stagger it out and all of a sudden you've got games starting at 10 a.m. and going until 10 p.m., then you can watch all those or 
it means that you basically have to extend the time of ki- like kickoff times, which yeah. means that maybe if it's on like in the Far East, then that means you get a game earlier, or a game right when you get home. Or maybe it means if it's here that you can watch from you know sun up to sundown. Yeah. Who knows for sure? But it does potentially theoretically allow you to watch more games, maybe. If you can make the commitment. If you can make the commitment. I vote more soccer. <laughs> I think we all do. <laughs> and I think also, we all do. by 2026... <laughs> FIFA certainly did. By 2026, DVR technology will be uh, <laughs> revolutionary. <Yeah. laughs> Everyone will have like massive, massive 50 terabyte hard drives. I mean, there's a um, chance that that crazy Japan proposal for 2022... Oh, bro- holograms. Games. Yeah, yeah. That could even be a thing. Where it's like, <laughs> yeah, that game is being played in Poland, but it's being broadcast at new RFK. Which will exist by 2026. <laughs> what about from a media perspective? Mm-hmm. Suddenly, everybody's um, newspaper pullout with the guide to the teams is 16 teams bigger. Our podcast preview series oh boy. is, uh, what, eight groups bigger? Yeah, we only need one extra co-host now instead of two. Oh, because each group would be yeah. three teams? Oh, that's actually easier. Yeah, sort of, except now <laughs> we each have to do, you and I each have to choose 16 teams. <laughs> but yeah, otherwise, why not? Um, final question I had on mm-hmm. format. The round of 32, because everyone's right. focused on the group stage, right? Mm-hmm. Top two teams go through, 32 teams remaining, right. 16 games that are single elimination. Right. Is that too many? I, I'm theoretically excited by that. I, th- I think the idea, I made this joke to you off air that it reminds me of like Jack Donaghy when he's running Cable Town <laughs> on 30 Rock. And it's just a lot of crazy things people like that he's decided that they should make a show out of. Uh-huh. And here it definitely feels like somebody in FIFA... I was like, you know what we need? Like, the knockout round is the best thing, but we don't want to go all knockout round. So we'll make the group stage feel like the knockout round, and then we'll add a whole other round. On. Let's do it. Like, it, it feels... I mean, that is what's happening. Yeah, it feels like it kind of feels thrown together. And so I get why. And it, <laughs> is it going to be broadcast on your microwave? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, he's responsible for microwave oven programming. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, but yes. Uh, and, and so I think that it's not necessarily too many teams, but... It kind of feels like, why not just go all the way and do 64 teams and have it be like March Madness style? I mean, I don't, honestly, I don't think that's impossible. Oh, I, I don't think it's impossible. I think it's a terrible idea. No, I mean, not immediately, but in the future. Like I said, more countries yeah. means right. more teams. True, but I believe that there are more basketball teams, college basketball teams, Division One at least, than 200 <laughs> <laughs> currently. So it makes making the tournament somewhat sweeter. Actually, that was my final point in support. Mm-hmm. I can't remember if I said this on Goldmouth or not this morning. Um, even with 48 teams, that's still more than three quarters of the teams in the world mm-hmm. don't qualify for the World Cup, mm-hmm. right? right? There's still plenty of um, plenty more teams disappointed than make the World Cup. Mm-hmm. So it's not as if everybody's invited. Yeah, and so I think what that points to is, again, you can go back and forth on it. And so I think what you have to land on is the reality is it's this is it's happening. We you're know gonna watch it's it. Gonna, it's going to happen. We know it's. Almost certainly going to be 16 groups of three unless they drastically change things mm-hmm. at the last minute, but that's what's been approved. Yep. So I think it makes more sense to be have some concerns, have some reasons for optimism, and know that it's going to happen and go into the tournament and see what happens. But if you look at this as the end of the World Cup as we know it, I don't think that that's fair. But I also don't think that this is the greatest thing that's ever happened and it shouldn't be treated as such. It should be treated as a thing that's happening that's changing a tournament and we should be mindful of what happens and if it's some things could come around that don't make sense, then you can be vocal about that. But you should still... Be excited because it means the World Cup will hopefully still exist in 2026. <laughs> and maybe just start banking some vacation days for yeah. 2020, for July 2026. Sure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Play it on the moon. <sighs> okay, and if it is on the moon, I know a place you'll still be able to get tickets. Are you alluding to SeatGeek? I am. Today's show is sponsored by SeatGeek. SeatGeek have made buying tickets online for sports and concerts less confusing than it's ever been. They've come along and created an amazing app and website. Makes it easier than ever for fans to buy and sell tickets. That's right. They want to help you get the most bang for your buck. Uh, They do all the price comparison for you by searching multiple ticket sites, ensuring you get the best deal. My question is, if it is SeatGeek in 2026, do they also provide travel? So if it's on the moon, (laughs) do do they give you the rocket ship to the dark side of the moon of the Sea of Tranquility (laughs) where that match is being played? They do, but they would also include the the seating chart where they give you like a grade um, for each seat. So you would know which is um, a good seat on the rocket ship Mm -hmm. because some seats have more rattle than others. You're going to have to sit next to a Vogon hard, hard you really want that yeah <laughs> <laughs> tickets next to Vogon's are very cheap <laughs> everyone's trying to offload them good point <laughs> Um, if you do want international soccer tickets, mm-hmm. you could use SeatGeek uh, to get tickets to the U.S. men playing Serbia mm-hmm. in January and Jamaica 
in February. Mm-hmm. You'll also be able to use the SeatGeek app to find MLS tickets in 2018. They will be mm-hmm. the official ticket sponsor of Major League Soccer. And best of all, if you use the SeatGeek app, you can get $20 off uh, your first purchase. You can go to Settings tab and click Add a Promo Code. Enter the promo code TSS. SeatGeek will send you $20 after you've made that first ticket purchase. So download the SeatGeek app and enter promo code TSS mm-hmm. today. Alrighty. Final thing on today's show, Taylor, the Total Soccer Show Scouting Network. We have, what, one, two, three updates to share with you. So I've heard the first one comes from Chris Goodwin, who's scouting Oren McKinsey game. You sound very confident <laughs> in that pronunciation after yesterday's show. I do. We had a few different people say it could be either way. Uh-huh. That, that was on Twitter. But Chris Goodwin sends us a link to a YouTube video that's an interview with Oren McKinsey Gaines when he was still playing in Texas, I think it was. It might have been California. I can't remember which one. But it's him as a, like a tiny, tiny child, uh, which was two and a half, <laughs> almost three years ago, um, in which he ends with, I'm Oren McKinsey Gaines. So he has let us know that that is how you pronounce it. Thank you, Chris. That's mm-hmm. top scouting. And if anyone missed yesterday's show, the reason we're talking about Oren McKinsey McKinsey Gaines is he played for Wolfsburg in a friendly against Tampa Bay Rowders and he got himself an assist. He is in the Wolfsburg first team, Mm -hmm. but only for their winter friendlies. And while we're updating uh, scouting reports from yesterday, also worth noting, I believe Haji Wright got 17 minutes for the Schalke senior team in their friendly uh, during their winter break camp. Okay. Almost had a goal. I think he, I was either just wide or almost had the assist that was also turned just wide. Did Michael Curry email us? Yes, I believe he did. Okay. I can't remember if he did or if I saw that somewhere else. Michael email us. for yesterday's. I feel mm-hmm. like with some of these American youngsters, we're getting ahead of our scouts because we're on it for the, <laughs> for the show. Take that, scouts. But still email us, uh, Michael, still email us if you have some Haji Wright news. Please do. We also got a scouting report from Joe Martella about Martin Odegaard, the 18-year-old um, crazy talented midfielder for Real Madrid. We assume still crazy talented, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. For Real Madrid. I mean, he played recently in the Copa del Rey, right? True. So we, mm-hmm. we saw those skills still. Um, Joe says, I heard on Twitter just a little bit ago, we, we retweeted it, mm-hmm. um, that Odegaard is officially on loan to Heronvain, a Dutch team in the Eredivisie. The team is doing better than last year. They're currently fourth, finished 12th last year, but still a ways off from the front runners, Feyenoord and Ajax. Not sure about the team's midfield, says Joe, but Odegaard is almost sure to get first team minutes, more first team minutes in the league mm-hmm. uh, with uh, Heronvain than he was with Madrid, because with Madrid, it was zero. Correct. <laughs> and you said on Gomez today that you feel like this is the move he should have made to begin with, right? Yeah, so the story with Odegaard is when he was 15, mm-hmm. he was playing, I can't remember the name of the team, in the Tippeligan in Norway, really making people look foolish, mm-hmm. looking incredible. But then is at what? Odd? Is that possible? Or was no. that, I think that was another teenager. That's the one that made Matt Tumble swear, I believe. I could yes. be wrong, though. Yeah, you're right, yeah. Okay. Um, so he got that move when he was like 16, I think, to Real Madrid, which just seemed overly ambitious because mm-hmm. you're not going to go straight into the Real Madrid first team. They have Cristiano Ronaldo. Yeah, he's pretty decent. Right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I thought maybe a move from Tipperley, which is still a good standard for a 15, 16 year old to be playing in. Mm-hmm. If you're going to make the move up, Eredivisie seems perfect. Like a mid table ish Eredivisie team mm-hmm. seems like a good fit. So, yeah, there were two years with Real Madrid's, uh, I guess, mostly B and C team. Um, and then now he's with Heronveen. So mm-hmm. it's going to be okay. It's not, too, it's not too late for him to sort of really have the stellar career that everybody's hoping for. Mm-hmm. And it, it's still probably a step up from the Norwegian, Norwegian League to Definitely. go to Heronveen. Definitely. Not so much a step up in terms of ease of pronunciation, but that, that's <laughs> fine. That's fine. And so we look forward to lots of Martin Odegaard highlights mm-hmm. in the Eredivisie. That we do, my friend. Any other reports before we call quits on this show? Uh, there was the Derek Etienne Jr. report we need to get to. How did I forget and you remembered? Yes, uh, Derek Etienne scored his first uh, goal for the Haiti senior national mm-hmm. team in a Gold Cup qualifying. No, Caribbean Cup. Car- well, I was going to say Gold Cup qualifying playoff to qualify <laughs> for a playoff, I believe it was. So if I remember correctly, it was uh-huh. the fifth place playoff mm-hmm. group stage, right. final game, um, Haiti versus Trinidad. Yeah. Um, Etienne scored, yep. and Haiti finished top of that group, which means they finished fifth place in the Caribbean Cup, which means they play off against the fifth place team in the Centro Americana yep. Cup, mm-hmm. and the winner of that gets to go to the Gold Cup. There it is. And mm-hmm. the reason we're so excited is uh, Derek Etienne Jr. plays for New York Red Bulls 2, mm-hmm. um, is a Richmond, Virginia native, and is full of skills. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I was actually Facebooking with his father right oh, right. before. Oh, because he's coach, yeah. right? Yeah. Derek um, and Daryl Etienne? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Can you guess which one is his dad? Since he's Derek Etienne Jr. Uh, Derek. <laughs> Correct. Uh, and the goal itself is is pr- it's pretty interesting to watch because it comes about from a Haiti free kick, like uh, outside the box on the left hand side of the field, 
And I guess the Trinidad players were stopped, had stopped to protest or talk to the referee. But there's two of them standing on either side of the ball about five yards off. And the, the Haiti player just passes to Etienne, who's standing wide open in the box. He takes one touch, bends it around the keeper from about 16, 18 yards out. It's a well-taken goal. And then uh, Haiti go, back, go on to win 4-3 to three in a very tight game. Wow. Mm-hmm. All right. Bad news for Trinidad, though. Yeah. Right? Not great. Mm-hmm. Things going horribly for the new coach. It corresponds with the lack of correspondence from uh, DJ Ringus. Yeah. I know he's not thrilled about yeah. the current state of events. But we're thrilled about you, DJ. So there you go. <laughs> Maybe Levi Garcia will lead a bright new future of uh, Trinidadian football. Hooray! Hooray. <laughs> All right. Thank you to everybody for the scouting reports. If you'd like to join the Total Soccer Show Scouting Network, you would be supporting the Total Soccer Show, helping us keep the show going until at least 2026. You can go to totalsoccershow.com slash subscribe and you can see all the options for supporting the show there any level you subscribe at we will add you to the tss scouting network and we will uh, assign you a promising young player to keep an eye on this is true so that's today's show almost in the books we'll be back tomorrow with i believe some rumor mongering is that correct well we're gonna teach you we're not teach you we're gonna suggest ways that you can Mm -hmm. find your way through the rumor mongering to find what's real and what's not and then after doing that guide to reading transfer rumors and then after doing that we're going to speculate on some rumors or some transfers that we would like to see happen John Brooks to Arsenal there we go I think we might have to move that off the table because we both (laughs) just want that yeah Mustafi I think has taken that spot as well we might not want that anymore I take that back yeah good point Mm -hmm. good point (laughs) all right until tomorrow Taylor Rockwell thank you for taking the time to talk to me today Right back at you, buddy. Listeners, thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you again on Wednesday. 